as you'd grow from childhood to adulthood, your tastes would deepen and gain sophistication. Your life experiences, your experiences with culture, would cause your palate and tastes to expand, allowing you to assimilate and enjoy things that possess a greater, an ever greater amount of contradictions and abstractions. For example, children are taught nursery rhymes and simple songs that teach them about society's basic truths, and they're simple, and at the same time it teaches them a basic, uh, the, the, the society's basic conception of what melody and harmony is. And reasonably cultured adults in the old days, which was just about everyone from the lower classes to upper classes, um, were aspirational culturally. They learned to play piano, they learned to appreciate the old Western, the old masters of art and of Western classical music. And there was a reason why people thought that young adults should read the great books or to hear the great symphonic or chamber works because it prepared them for a lifetime of ever deepening experience with art and culture. So, what this means is in all of these things, in, in music, in the great works of literature, in visual arts, in cinema, etc., there was an expectation that you had to do some intellectual work and that you had to bring with you some frame of reference. You need experience to go from stage A to stage B. And often that had to do with not just, often it was interdisciplinary. It had to do not just with the art you were looking at, but also with religion and history and other genres and things like that. Uh, because good art would reveal, uh, would not reveal its secrets and delights on first hearing or first exposure. It requires some background and an education. And that's because art is always, and culture also, is always a dialogue with tradition, whether explicitly or not. And um, it's, it's important to note that this is true also when considering the avant-garde in art, which is something that many conservatives recoil at, but it's nevertheless essential. Um, for example, very celebrated example, French New Wave was a dialogue and a very warm and affectionate tribute to, Amer to American film noir with other added elements. Um, in the early 1960s, but it's impossible to grapple with one without understanding the references to another. So all this is said, these were the things that used to be accepted, uh, like accepted for adults to be able to deal with. And at the same time, um, at the same time, we had an, another world of art and culture that was specifically for children. Um, we, have art, we have art for children, and then we have art for adults. And that divide has broken down. Of course, we still have things for literal babies, um, and Sesame Street and things like that, but once you get to about age 12 or preteen, all the barriers fall away, and it's just, it's, it's just, kind of the same. That's our common culture today. And, um, and I think that that's a tremendously horrible thing. So, uh, so how did we get here? I think Gen X, my generation, is wonderful in many ways, but I think it's, I think it's chiefly responsible for breaking down this barrier, in the US at least. And I remember this because I was there. And the example I always think of, a significant cultural event that that often goes unremarked is the 1997 re-release of Star Wars. When I was a kid, I was a Star Wars fanatic, but I was eight, I was 10 years old, and all of my friends were also Star Wars fanatics. And then we kind of walked away from it and we got into more adult things. We put away childish things. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a line about that. 
And by the time we got to, you know, I mean, in 97, I was in college. By the time we got to, to college, we were off listening to different things and, and being interested in different things and, and all that. Boom, Star Wars re release comes out. And the media campaign surrounding the re-release sort of told you, you know what, it's okay to like this stuff forever. It's okay to be a Star Wars geek for the rest of your life. And I think that opened the floodgates for a lot of people who had heretofore been kind of growing culturally to say, you know what, I'm going to be basically the same um, person aesthetically and culturally that I was when I was 12. That's good, that's fine. And uh, so there is a, um, there are tremendous negatives to that, not only in the, in the fact that, that, you know, um, as, we, as these superhero movies get more and more ridiculous, more and more woke, and have less, of le less and less kind of cultural, artistic, aesthetic content, um, the, the dynamic has changed. It's turned into a very, very passive um, a, a situation where people are assimilating culture in a very, very passive way. Because people only watch superhero movies now, and only superhero movies with great, expensive budgets can be made, okay, that means that the only people who can create the things that the mass, you know, the masses of the people want to see are huge multinational corporations that have unlimited budgets and, and can do this sort of thing. Well, that ends up turning art into nothing but product. And it is the most passive thing that you know, it, 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 it completely changes the relationship that people have to... I mean, even when I talk about this, when I talk about aesthetics and culture and art with people, immediately they think, oh, okay, well, you know, the new, um, you know, the new Batman is out or blah, 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 blah. You replace the thing with any other product and it's like the new product from Pepsi. And people feel like they have a responsibility to buy it and, they, and it involves no thinking, they just sit and they enjoy. And um, I think this is, at the end of the day, it's a cultural catastrophe because it does break this link and it does break the expectation that we used to have of people putting in the work. Now, of course, we've, we're facing many challenges here, you know, at the kind of tail end of the American empire. And I don't think the arrested development of people's tastes is the number one most important issue and or the issue that leads to our current trouble. But I don't think it's a small thing. I think it makes people less sophisticated and less able to use their imaginations, and it distracts them. I mean, we want virtuous people, but we want a capable and intelligent people as well. And the cultural rot is making people dumber and less interesting by the year. So we're in a cultural mainstream that's been created and maintained by the left and it's a completely different world. It's one seized by fetishization of grievance in the form of the intersectional stack. And when it's not literally shaking, obsessing over race, gender, et cetera, the ethos has infected everything in contemporary culture and the corporate products that passes for art with degeneracy, apathy, and postmodernism. So, if you've seen right-wing Twitter, though, over the last several years, you know that there's been a kind of reaction against all this. People don't want it. They're searching for something better, and, and many are doing it already in their own lives. We see it in the embrace of beauty, health, fitness, and tradition, meaning effort, longevity, and standards. Architecture is a big one. You see tweets and accounts that post contrasts of beautiful old buildings side by side with big, ugly, brutalist monstrosities. And these get millions of interactions. And um, so I think the new right cares about aesthetics because at the most basic level, it stems from the idea of making an effort. The body positivity movement is a good example of this because 
behind the false mantra of, you know, beautiful at any size is the subtext, which is, it's not worth it to put in the work. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. The apathy is appealing to some, but Jordan Peterson's popularity, clean your room, is, uh, I think is proof that there's a massive audience out there, especially of young men, who want to try and who want to strive and who want to work at, you know, at, at, at doing these things. So I think this is especially true in the younger cohort who are unfortunate enough to have missed in their formative and childhood years the last great period of American optimism and civilizational self-confidence, which was the 1980s. But they're intelligent and they grew up with the digital tools um, with which they could see and really romance many of the things that they missed. So what they see in the past is a world free of ironic detachment. The ironic world of ironic detachment that's all around them. And what they crave is the authenticity of a pastime in America that clearly no longer exists. I think it's, a quiet, it's also a quiet but significant revolution against the mainstream that defined post-Cold War conservatism in America, also. So it, all this has left us with an opportunity to create and build new things. And I think many, many people are doing that uh, right now, and um, we are going to contribute to that with a, uh, a new project with the uh, wonderful, I'm starting a, uh, a uh, uh, graphic and design and art firm with um, the wonderful artist uh, Lee Brown, who is here. And uh, we're going to be creating original art pieces that reflect the sensibility of the project or commission that we're dealing with. Book covers, graphics, branding, anything else, things of beauty. We want to make nice things. I've worked in conservative, the conservative universe for a long time, and, and, and after a while, you, you start to notice that nobody cares about Nobody cares about these things. Nobody cares about art or culture or whatever. And we're in a time where more people are moving in that direction. I think there's an opportunity to do something great and to bring some culture into uh, you know, people's lives and also into, uh, into the political right. So we're very excited about this project and watch this space. Uh, Lionel Trilling once said that one has a moral obligation to be intelligent, and that's probably true, but I think one also has a moral obligation to have good taste, um, or at least something better than no taste at all. So, thank you very much.